Hi, I'm Elaine. Welcome to my podcast channel. Um, hi, Mr. Fortress. How are you doing today? Oh, doing fine. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, it would it would be great if you could introduce to us some of um, your specialties, your institution, and what you do, what you specialize in in math. Oh, I'm 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 a math professor at UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. which which means I sort of divide my time equally between teaching and sleeping. Okay. Except we're supposed to call it research, I guess. Yeah. So uh, that that is really interesting. So, um, what kind of math do you um, specialize in? Because Mo mostly algebra and number theory. So, so I, I start mm -hmm. off working on something called monstrous moonshine which was something my my supervisor john conway uh, was involved in where, where there's this sort of weird relation between the monster symbol group and mm -hmm. these things called modular forms mm -hmm. which was astonished everybody when john mckay first discovered it because these were seemed to be two completely unrelated areas yeah so i've actually heard of um Mr. John Conway. So uh, I've heard of, so I I do have friends who admire him too. Um, so she, uh, I mean, he developed um, Conway Conway Tangles and then Tangle Theory. Yeah. yeah. And that was really interesting. Um, yeah. How, uh, as an advisor, so you basically know him really well. Um, what do you think about him? Well, I didn't actually know more that well. I spent most of my time hiding from him, in fact. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I first came across him because I read mathematical games articles in Scientific American when I was a kid at high school. And, you know, there was this legendary figure, John Conway, in there. And then yeah. I was sort of amazed that I, you know, actually ended up working working with him a, a few mm -hmm. years later. Wow. Yeah, was he nice? Because, uh, I mean, John Conway, like, I, I really wanted to know him too. Um, but unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago during COVID. So what, 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 one of the things he specialized in was rescuing people who were kind of drifting a bit, with, such as me. I mean, um, um, that he, he, had, he had, uh, as well as me, he had several other students who had been mm -hmm. sort of floating around, not floating not, around not really knowing what to do and he'd sort of pick them up and rescue them and given them their, their, their things to do so, so he, he actually i think he actually deliberately did that i mean i think some someone had told him that i was having trouble finding a supervisor so he i mean i didn't go and ask him he actually tracked me down and asked me if i wanted to be his student wow that is really the totally opposite. And most students are, oh, could you be, please be my advisor? And he's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I didn't realize at the time just how nice he was being to me. Yeah, totally. So did he inspire you into your mathematical field right now? Um, sort of. I mean, I think the reason I got I got interested in monstrous moonshine is as actually being a to a talk by John Conway when I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. so, so you know he. Was giving this talk to some undergraduate math society and okay. mentioned this connection between the monster and modular forms and it just it was just so weird it just completely blew me away and i you know, tried to find out more about it mm -hmm. that's great and so i i can tell from how, uh, your description about him how he's um picking up people who who don't really know what math or whatever they want to do and i think from that he's a really kind person definitely yeah, he, he was very helpful to lots of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do have a few questions to ask. Um, for example, uh, since you're uh, working at Berkeley, um, how's what do you think is the most um, intriguing or interesting part about Berkeley's math program? Um, gosh, <laughs> I'm not so good at these. Um, these sorts of questions. What, what's good about it? Um, depends what you mean. Um, at, at the graduate level, one of what, what one of the good things about it is actually it's a rather large department, um, which means you have a lot of choice. Um, so I mean, well, well so, so some people prefer small departments where everybody knows everyone else and so on. But th this is the disadvantage that if you're, you know, you know you're you're going to a small department because you want to work work on some particular subject and if for some reason you don't get on with the with the one guy they have in that subject you're kind of stuck 
Right. Well, whereas in a large department, if something goes wrong, you can just move on to the next advisor, mm -hmm. and um, so, so you're, you're you're much less likely to ha have everything derailed because of one personality clash. Yeah, that's really really true, and I've heard that Berkeley, especially Berkeley, has a really really good math program, and it's a very big program, a big place. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 there's a huge amounts of choice in what to do i mean you you can almost always find something you're interested in yeah for sure uh so um regard to berkeley do you think the overall atmosphere are people more serious or casual in tone Is, are they nice well, or they berkeley people are mostly fairly casual although i mean i haven't actually been to that many other departments i'm, I'm not quite sure how to compare i mean i sort of had this vague vision of some east coast math departments from the 1950s where everyone wears suits and is very formal and so on but i'm i'm, I'm sure that no longer applies anymore oh. um, um even, even in places like princeton yeah so um, I, maybe 50 or 100 years ago but right um, Mm -hmm. because Berkeley is actually a really really famous place so I at first had the impression that everyone wore suits in lecture halls and then they're with that chalkboard and chalk writing but it's oh. probably my impression like I thought yeah. everyone wore suits but <laughs> yeah yeah I, I, I've heard of someone's telling me about one department where all one university where all the lecturers wear suits on the first day of lectures and yeah. after that drop wearing suits but maybe that's just an urban legend mm -hmm. maybe yeah they they want to create a great impression that first day and yeah yeah interesting yeah um so uh i was wondering if you could tell us some of your maybe leak out some of your um research like what what specifically you're doing in your research and why it's interesting maybe talk about some equations or uh, concepts that you think because you talked about the monster monstrous moonshine would you like to share about what you learned or what is so m shocking here oh uh, gosh well it's it's uh very, very difficult sorry it's, it's not easy to say in a few minutes um I, I guess I could just mention the the first thing I heard about it, which was, you know, the, 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 so the monster group is, you, know, you can think of it as being symmetries of something, and, and it lives in huge dimensional space, um, 196883 dimensions. It's so big it won't fit into three or four dimensional space. You need to go up to this huge number, 196,683. It's that big. Um, and then there's a completely, utterly unrelated area of mathematics called modular functions. Yeah. And one modular function is called, the, the, the simplest is called the elliptic modular function. And mm -hmm. it, it has a power series expansion which starts off q to the minus 1 plus 744 plus 196884 q. Yeah. And it's got this number 196884, which differs by 1 from the size of the space the monster lives in and this was first noticed by john mckay and mm -hmm. when he told people about this most people the reaction of most mathematicians is this is just a meaningless coincidence you know if, if, if you take a lot of numbers you know if you take a few hundred numbers some of them are going to be very close to each other just by coincidence and this is just a meaningless coincidence um anyway it turned out not to be um you know, there, there are some other dimensions the monster lives in, and these turn out to be more or less the same as other coefficients of the elliptic modular function. So, so um, the problem was to explain why these numbers turn up in two apparently completely unrelated areas of mathematics. Actually, John Mackay was so pleased with his discovery, mm -hmm. he, he had a special T-shirt made, which had this equation 196884 equals 1 plus 196883 written on it. Mm -hmm. This is his, his biggest discovery. Yeah, that is really, really interesting. Um, so, uh, so there's like um, a lot of high school students are actually suffering through math, even though you're a math professor at Berkeley, but um, um, currently a lot of high school students, um, they have 
problems with math? Do you think it's mainly because they're not interested or uh, they just need to build their fundamentals and move forward? Well, well um, this is an answer you might not want to hear, but everybody has problems with mathematics. And no matter what you do or how far you go, you have problems yeah. with mathematics. For I sure. mean, it's just human brains are just not designed to do mathematics and it's you know it's difficult for everybody no matter what level you are in fact no matter how good you are at mathematics you can always find another mathematician who seems to be infinitely better than you right um, i've heard of this very um sad thing is that for example you spend hypothetically speaking you spend um 20 years on a problem and maybe someone like isaac newton maybe an einstein he just like just solves it overnight which is really it, it does happen or or you can publish the result of your work and discover someone else published it six months earlier that yeah i mean i mean i mean you're, you're asking the wrong question the, the question is not you, you shouldn't be asking why do we have so much trouble doing mathematics mm -hmm. so yeah the question you should be asking is why can we do mathematics at all Hmm. I mean, I mean, look, look, look at how humans evolved. You know, you know, you know sort of fifty thousand years ago, we were all sort of running around on the African savanna, mm -hmm. trying to catch mm -hmm. whatever something to eat. And anybody who had the genes to make them sort of think abstract thoughts while they were walking along would have been eaten by a, the next passing lion. I mean, yeah. the, the genes for interest in abstract thought should have been wiped out. Um, mm -hmm. And and the fact we can th think about mathematics at all is really bizarre. I mean, the, 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 there seems to be no evolutionary advantage to being able to do mathematics or being interested in it. Well, uh, speaking about math, it really is the fundamentals of how our society today operates. And so it is, to a certain extent, um, quite essential. Possibly it's essential, but it sure wasn't essential when we were evolving a hundred thousand years ago. Sure, yeah. I mean, evolution doesn't see the future and decide decide to be make people interested in mathematics because it might be useful in a thousand generations. Yeah, for sure. So it, it's kind of odd how this math or logic um, abstract abstract thinking really passed on to today, and it's still progressing. Um, so do you think math itself is it invent is a human invented or do you think it's a spiritual concept that exists and it's not invented by humans okay well well um one way to answer that question you you can phrase it a bit more precisely suppose there's an alien civilization on alpha centauri okay. do they have the same mathematics as us i mean if they do then mathematics sort of exists independent of human thought and if they don't then then it doesn't and um so, so, so my answer to that would be if if there are alien civilizations then they have pretty much the same mathematics as we do i mean obviously they use completely different notation for it and so on i mean you, you know you know if, if 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 someone in france does mathematics it sounds completely different from someone in england doing mathematics but mm -hmm. It's really the same underlying thing if you translate from one to the other. And in, in the same way, my, my feeling would be that alien civilizations would be doing exactly the same mathematics as us up to some translation. For sure. And I think the most amazing thing about math itself is how it's a universal language. Maybe yeah, it's sort of. Yeah. The Earth, for now in general, there's also sayings that were the simulations of aliens you know we're... yeah 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 we're, yeah we're... but um so as a professor at berkeley um are, do you have students what's the most um common problem related to math that you find in your college in college students that they are facing and i and you think that i have to solve this problem here um I think, I think, well, I'm not sure what the most common problem is, but one very common problem is students working in mathematics, especially in math research, just kind of get depressed because they're not getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one one really serious problem in mathematics is we've been doing, there have been too many mathematicians working on mathematics for too long. And, and the result is every easy problem has been solved. And mm -hmm. um, that means by definition, any problem you're trying to work on is... A problem that nobody has managed to solve you know 
hundreds of people have probably looked at it and no one has managed to solve it for centuries so, so, so we're, we're just almost running out of um problems that, that, that people starting off in mathematics can work on yeah for sure um so could you give us an example of um a math problem that you got really stuck on and then it took you a long time and journey to discover the deeper meaning about well <laughs> that, that applies to any, pretty much any math problem that either i or anybody else has worked on these days um as, right. I, as i said if, if, if anything easy someone else would have done it by now right um, mm -hmm. so, so the yeah the, the the moonshine conjectures i spent uh, probably five or probably no, 10 years working on it before i managed to figure out what was going on and that's that sort of time scale of taking a few years to solve a problem is probably fairly typical in mathematics yeah um i mean not for all people i mean so, so some people have a very much faster turnover but mm -hmm. um that, that, that it seems to be typical of anyone solving a um people who solve really major problems in mathematics it seems to take you know five or ten years at least these days i mean that some examples of you know perelman solved the poincare conjecture and he sort of hid from everybody else for about 10 years while doing that and wiles solved fermat's last theorem by going to hiding for seven years and working on it and so on mm -hmm. so, so uh working as um in the math faculty um and so you're working with a lot of different mathematicians. Was it difficult for you to find um, um, partners, like friends, who are willing to work on the same problem that you are working on? So, you know, mathematicians, they work together in a group. Was it difficult like, uh, math uh, Mathematicians sometimes work together in a group, but I don't really work very much with uh, other mathematicians. Mm -hmm. um, and. I mean, some of the best mathematicians do do a lot of papers and work, work with others. I mean, M Michael Atier was, you know, maybe the one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. He was really good at collaborating and worked with lots of other people and similarly with people like Groth and Dick. And on the other hand, there are other mathematicians who, who work entirely by themselves and almost never work with anybody else. Um, like Selberg was a well-known example of this. He, he always worked entirely by himself. Mm -hmm. So mathematicians just vary a lot, depending. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I mean, there, there's very much a fashion these days for trying to make mathematicians collaborate with each other mm -hmm. more. But I, I'm never really sure this is really. Not uh, really sure if this is possible. This is not always helpful. Mm -hmm. it's, it, I mean, definitely, it's not that helpful because you have your own thinking and then maybe someone your 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 friend has a different thinking so i think yeah yeah so, yeah so, so some sometimes working with somebody else can be helpful because you get stuck and the other person just sees how to push it around a corner but so some people just don't like working with others very much and you know you prefer to think about a problem by yourself for a long time mm -hmm. That, that 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 is really true. I think um, so. Basically, the this common misconception that I think a lot of people have this common misconception that mathematicians work in pairs or in triads or oh, quite, quite, quite often they do. Yeah, uh, I mean it's it, it's not false, but but you should just say that quite often they also work just by themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, are there? I mean, if you consider about math in general, um, there's plenty of branches in math. Are there any branches that you personally think, I mean, not not trying to offend any other mathematicians, but are there branches that you think might just get removed or stop developing through the ages? You know, it just... it's, it's, it's very hard to say. I mean, I, I remember in the past, there were some areas of mathematics that I thought were just worthless junk. And then Later on, for some reason, I looked into them and decided, discovered they were much deeper and richer than I'd thought. So, so, so it's dangerous to write off any any branch of mathematics as being worthless. Um, having said that, we, I, I will do so anyway. Um, I mean, what one example is of a, of a subject that seems to have almost died out is, is Euclidean geometry. So, yeah. so 
2,000 years ago, Euclidean geometry was a very big piece of mathematics. But the trouble is it seems to have basically ran, run out of problems. I mean, I, I, I can't think of anyone for about the last 100 years who's, who's really discovered anything really new in Euclidean geometry. So it sort of died out almost because it's it's almost finished. Right. So are you a more geometric or algebraic person, would you say? Mostly algebraic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean you, 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 you can, there's, the, there's this sort of quote by, I, I can't remember, I think maybe Herman Weil or someone who says that, you know, and, and every, ma every mathematician has an, an angel and a devil whispering into their ear and the, the angel is trying to tell them to do geometry and the devil is trying to tell them to do algebra. Yeah. And, and the, 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 Algebra at first sight seems good because it gives you this powerful technique just for calculating things. But 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 you have to, in order to do algebra, you have to give away your soul and and mm. stop, stop your stop using your geometric intuition for things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. But but I'm definitely more 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 algebra than geometry. Yeah, is there a specific reason for that, or you're just more favored to one? I, I have no idea. Probably something to do with the way my brain is wired, or whatever. Yeah, so um, uh, I can. It seems like you're a more um, theoretically, maybe less visual person. Yeah, to some extent. Yeah, I mean, I mean, pe people seem to differ an enormous amount in the way their brains work. As you say, some people are have far more powerful visual imaginations than others. And I've noticed other people can learn languages, seem to learn languages far more easily than I do and so on. So Yeah, I thought so, math is a language itself. You have to learn well, a lot of symbols and Yeah, that that, that 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 that's actually puzzled me a bit that I can I can learn mathematical language. As you say if, in in some sense mathematics is a sort of language and I seem to have no problems with that. But any any ordinary language like French or German or Spanish or whatever, I, I, I just learn it and immediately forget it the next day. Yeah, I think um, one way is, I think one reason, I guess, personally, maybe uh, interest or interest, like, like um, you're more interested in math, you're devoted to it. So you learn things and pick things up faster. It's it, probably something to do with that. But, yeah. but, I mean, but I'm interested in, but I'm interested in it partly because I'm quite good at it and I'm good at it because I'm interested in so it's a sort of reinforcing cycle yeah I was wondering if um a lot of people are actually also um wondering if some people are good at math and they're not interested in in math are there people who are like not good at math but they're so interested in math is there something like that happening or you have to be good and you have maybe but I mean I thought very few people are going to get good at mathematics if they're not interested in it, unless they've got some sort of, well, I mean, actually, you occasionally get people whose parents sort of force them to do mathematics, even though they're not interested, and they, they, they get quite good up to a certain level and then drop it as soon as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, their parents are dead or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think this isn't just mathematics. It's the same with you can see the same with lots of other things like music, for example. You can see plenty of people who are forced to learn a musical instrument, even though they're not interested in it. And plenty of people who are very interested in music, but couldn't play anything to save their lives. Mm -hmm. And do you think that mathematical success actually derives from interest? If you're not passionate, then you will not go so far in that math path. I'd be very surprised to see anybody successful at mathematics who wasn't really interested in it but then that that's true of success in almost anything um mm -hmm. it's you know you, it's very difficult to think of anything you could be successful at without being really interested in it yeah for sure uh so i was also wondering um are do you have any specific um teaching style that makes you kind of different from other professors um, in math, like formatting or what books do you want your students to read? 
and what, what do you think is significant in your teaching? I, I don't have any very strict teaching styles. I mean, I, I discovered that people have all sorts of completely different learning styles. So some people prefer going to lectures and others prefer reading books and others learn by just doing lots of problems. So you can't really, I don't think it's a good idea to force my preferred teaching or learning style on students. Um, um, so, so, I mean, certainly when I teach, I, I, I try and arrange it so that students can either read books or go to my lectures or listen to me on YouTube and they can pick whichever is best for them. Yeah, I've actually, uh, I think that math, I don't know if this is true, but a lot of math is done on the whiteboard or the blackboard. So uh, why is that the case? Like a lot of students need to solve problems themselves and then write them on the blackboard and then in separate groups. I think that's what happens. I, 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 I'm not that keen on writing things on blackboards or whiteboards, mm -hmm. so I don't really have much comment on this. I mean, maybe there are some professors who do like making students write their work on blackboards, but mm -hmm. my, my feeling is that that's not terribly useful. I mean, when, when I've seen students write mm -hmm. things on blackboards, half the time they're, they're, they're under so much stress that they, that, 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 that they couldn't tell you your, their name if you asked them. Oh, um, really? It's just very... For some people, it's really stressful working with somebody else watching. Right. Is it because um, do you think the stress um, needs to be overtaken in order to, like, they have to get over it once, if especially for people who want to be mathematicians, they have to um, go get over this stress and anxiety of showing their work to and presenting it well, to. A, a very easy way of getting over the stress and anxiety of working with someone else watching you is to work when someone else isn't watching you and <laughs> i mean you know the the, the um I, I i i almost never do mathematics with with someone else watching me or in the room because it's i, I just can't concentrate with someone else around Mm -hmm. And I assume this is fairly common. Right, because whenever you're, especially you're writing it very large on the whiteboard, you just don't know whenever people are watching or taking a peek, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think writing on paper actually works better. Um, so we, we, we also have um, a lot of high school students are, are very, very keen on doing like um, math competitions, so. Uh, do you think that is significant in this mathematical field? Do you think math is really just about competitions? It depends. I mean, it varies from person to person. Some people really like competitions and other people are put off by it. So you know, the, 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 there's no harm in having competitions for those who benefit from competitions. But um, I'd say most of the most of the best mathematicians now were not involved in math competitions when they were younger, so it's certainly not essential. Mm -hmm. um, and there's th th somehow very, very different timescale involved. So in a math competition, you're testing someone's ability to think hard for five minutes or maybe half an hour or something. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, if you're actually working as a mathematician, you're the, the, the time scale is more like a year or two years or something to solve a problem. So, so comparing math problems with actually working in mathematics is like you know comparing sprinting fifty meters with running a marathon. I mean, you, you can be very good at one without being any good at the other. Mm -hmm. So, do you think uh, math co competitions? Do you think they should even exist? Because it kind of goes against this typical way of how math goes. You have to spend time on it. And no, 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 they, they should exist. They, they work for some people. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying that they should exist. They just shouldn't be compulsory or expected. They, they should be something that, that people who enjoy them should do. And people who don't enjoy them, well, you obviously don't do them. Mm -hmm. So for some students who they want to apply for like a prestigious, prestigious college or university, um, do you think math is a way 
or showing, demonstrating your competency apart from other people who don't do math, but they read a lot of math. So you kind of sort of like one person gets qualifications and the other person just do it for fun. Yeah, well, uh, yes, this this, uh, uh, this idea of using math as a qualification is actually a bit of a, in some ways it's a bit of a problem. I mean, there, there, there are a lot of places, I mean, a, a well-known example is medical schools will just basically insist that all applicants take a certain amount of calculus or whatever. And this is not because the medical school cares, could, cares whether doctors can do calculus or not. It's just a way of kind of using mathematics to screen out a few people. Mm -hmm. So um, math is a very competitive field. It can be. Yeah, right. it, it, it's a real, it's, it, this is actually a real nuisance because when, when you're teaching a math course and and it's full of people who aren't interested in math but need a good grade to get into right. whatever school they're applying to, they, 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 they will continually bug you for a higher grade. For, really? You know, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, your students at Berkeley, do you, do you normally have these talks with your students and then they're talking about grades and I really need this for my medical or engineering degree? Well, they, they, they won't usually say, I mean, you do occasionally get students who say they, who come up to you and say, can I have a higher grade because I needed to get into such and such a school? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not very really common because most students ha have enough sense to see that if they, if they ask you for a grade because if they ask you for a higher grade just because they needed to get into school oh, you know you're, you're just going to say no explicitly. they don't really say it that explicit they're kind of like mm, i need a i really need that this course is really important to me so do you want to yeah. help me with that <laughs> yeah yeah um so uh do you personally have are are there is there an example of a student who you're really proud of over your years of teaching and what quality qualities does he or she have that you really think is admirable? Uh, I, th I think I better pass on that question. Talking about specific people is getting a bit. Oh, oh you don't have to uh, talk about their names. It could be. Yeah, yeah but e e even so, it's, it's uh, people probably end up being identifiable from this. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Uh, so um, so the the uh, math program at Berkeley is at four years like other universities. The, the, the undergraduate one is four years. Um, graduate program, typically five years, but it varies quite a lot. Mm -hmm. so, so people can get through it in three years if they're really lucky or really smart and other people just never get through it at all and sort of still hanging around after about 10 years and wow and so. yeah uh uh could i for example if i go to berkeley math um could if i study super hard can i graduate in two years of this whole you don't actually know um this th th this involves knowing about berkeley university regulations which i stay clear of as much as possible um the, the, the rules for what undergraduates can or can't do in order to graduate are incredibly Byzantine, and I've I've never figured them out. Mm -hmm. So I'll have to pass on that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, talking about math and certifications, um, uh, if you just heard about, because um, all mathematicians, mathematicians, you guys work really hard on something um, when someone else achieves an award or uh, a qualifications or a fields medal does that kind of appear to be bothersome or annoying like oh why can't i get one or uh i don't really know i mean it's it's actually not 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 something most mathematicians pay a whole lot of attention to um People don't go into mathematics because they hope to win some sort of award. You, you, you go into mathematics because you 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 are interested in doing it. Yeah. So it's really this intrinsic motivation that propels you to um, discover more about math. Yeah. 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 Uh, so in physics and other sciences, um, especially in physics, I've heard that there a lot have been discovered on Earth till now do you think math could still progress forward like are there still so many to discover or do you think that it will just 
you'll we will be finished in a few years and then everything will be discovered well well mathematicians are way ahead of you because we've actually proved a theorem saying there will always be more mathematics to be discovered i mean this is godel's incompleteness theorem which says roughly speaking you can never get to the end of mathematics oh i mean yeah. it's quite possible we might get to the end of mathematics that humans are capable of understanding um however um artificial intelligence is progressing really rapidly these days so so sure. maybe sometime in a couple of decades um you know humans will know i mean artificial intelligence will have got so good that it's that, that there's there's no real point in humans trying to do mathematics anymore because Whoa. artificial intelligence is just really? so much better than them well so this is this has already happened in chess for example that, oh, that's yeah. the the best chess playing programs, um, a human just doesn't stand a chance against them. Mm -hmm. And you know, in a few years, we, we might be in the same position for mathematics research. Mm -hmm. So you think that if AI, artificial intelligence, keep on progressing on computer science and all, and all kinds, so uh, do you think that we no longer need mathematicians anymore? I, I don't know. This involves predicting the future. Um, it's it's very hard to know what will happen when artificial intelligence gets that good there's the dystopian vision that, 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 that artificial intelligence might just take over and wipe out all humans or something yeah. or maybe you know we, we may end up with humanity wiped out or we may end up in some sort of paradise where nobody has to work anymore um it's very hard to tell what will happen mm -hmm. so uh but do you think is there like a fundamental even though you mentioned that um robots are really really smart and that could actually take over human intelligence to some certain degree uh do you think if you just compare mathematicians to robots and how they can also kind of solve problems uh do you think that humans are smarter in a way how they are more creative um I, humans still have an edge but how long that will last it's not really clear um I mean, there are all sorts of things that people thought that computers couldn't possibly do because humans were more creative that, than them. And and recently we've had, you know, artificial intelligence programs that can, you've probably seen the ones like DALI and so on, that, 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 that can draw, that can rather quickly draw, you know, artistic paintings that seem to me at least to be of, just as good as the ones drawn by expert human artists. Yeah. So, human, I mean, whether or not computers are as creative as humans, they seem to be very good at faking creativity so that we can't really tell the difference. I, I'd be very wary of saying that humans are more creative than computers because in almost every subject where people thought humans were more creative, computers have eventually overtaken humans. So computers are in some degree also really creative. We know how to well, do that. In, <laughs> if, if they're not, they're really good at faking it. So faking it as in we just cannot tell which one is if real. If they can fake it so well that we can't tell the difference, then I, I think I would you we, we can give them the benefit of the doubt and say they are creative. Uh so I can I can see from your background that you have a shelf of books. Are they all math books? These ones are all math books yeah wow um uh what what kinds of books is it like math the premium math books from all over the world like you just collect them i i don't know i i, I i've never quite understood where all these books came from because as far as i can figure out i don't actually buy all that many books i mean every couple of months i buy one book and and i calculate i calculate it how many math books I should have based on my rate of buying them. And, and mm -hmm. as far as I can figure out, there should be about two shelves of math books. And somehow right. uh, there seems to be far more than that. So, so I, I've never quite understood where they all came from. Right. So approximately how many do you estimate math of the number of math books you have currently? Um, I don't know. Uh, probably a thousand or two thousand or something. Wow. I don't claim to have read anywhere near all of them. In fact, I'm not sure I've read any of them. I mean, 
Math books, I mean, when you're reading a math book, you don't sit down from page one and read through to the end in the same way that you do for a novel. So there are there are very few math books that I've read all the way through from beginning to end. Right. So um, since you have so many math books, um, do you normally buy them just for reading? Is it just a part, a portion of that book that you find really interesting? And then that's why you bought it. You just want to read that page and then. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Various reasons. I mean, sometimes you're just curious about a subject and buy a math book on it and read a couple of pages and discover that subject wasn't really as interesting as you thought or. And sometimes you you buy a math book because this is a really interesting thing and I think I really ought to read about it and somehow I never quite find the time to do so because I've got this pile of 500 books all of which I really want to read and hey, maybe you can give some to me and I can read it <laughs> <laughs> well I think I ought to start giving them away sooner or later because there's uh, there's just no way I'm going to get through all the all the math books I've presently got yeah right so you have a lot of um choices in front of you so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i can probably drop by and you can <laughs> i can buy some of your books because it's, yeah. it's like a library yeah i haven't really um found like like a library of math books or a math library or a math bookstore well it's it's not so essential these days since since now that you can get pretty much anything on the internet mm -hmm. Uh, so what site do you normally go to to um, search for math books or buy math books like or because in bookstores modern days they normally bookstores just sell novels instead. yeah yeah, yeah. The, you, you, you can't buy you, you you can't you can't really buy math books in bookstores anymore so so just buy them when I do buy them you just buy them online in the obvious places I mean the, the American mathematical society, sells mm -hmm. books online and there are obvious places like Amazon and Abbey Books and so on. Oh yeah, that's great. So amongst your thousands of books, which which one or two do you um, highly recommend for maybe high school students to read? Like as a as a thriller or as an interesting thing to look at? For, for, for a math book? Yeah. Well, um, ag again, it depends very much on the high school student. I, I, I can tell you one that particularly caught my attention, and that that that, that, that was the book on um, number theory by Borevich and Shafarovich. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just, you know, when I was in high school, I just came across this book by almost by accident in in a in a library. I mean, it, <laughs> I'm not even quite sure what the book was doing in the library. I mean, it was a rather unusually advanced book, but but somehow mm -hmm. that, that that particular book really caught my attention and. Yeah. Right, it was, it was a, written by Russians who have a very different style for writing about mathematics. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it somehow seemed to be much more lively than the than the Western style math books I'd been looking at. For sure. Um. So, just another point. Um, talking about reading math books, like I I noticed a problem how you couldn't really understand or go through math just by reading it independently you have to find someone or a teacher to explain the concepts to you is that true no um well again th th this this i think is one of the things where people have very different learning styles that mm -hmm. some people only seem to learn mathematics by having an actual other person explain to them in words yeah. and other people learn mathematics by reading books and thinking about it very hard and you know rereading it several times in order to try and understand it so yeah i think it varies from person to person mm -hmm. sorry i could also um observe your background from your um geometric spaces uh like you know these figures do you think um having a more tangible uh, figure actually helps to advance or helps you to solve problems to actually have something tangible in front of you um sometimes um depends a bit on what you're working on but but i mean what, what one very powerful technique in mathematics is to is to kind of convert an abstract mathematical problem to something you can look at more or less explicitly i mean if if you can actually draw 
a picture of something or you know build a three-dimensional object then then then, then this often allows you to understand some piece of mathematics much more clearly. I mean, um, it's not surprising, really, because hu humans have an enormous amount of their brain devoted to interpreting um, visual pictures. I mean, the, I mean the, the amount of processing you need to do in order to understand what your eye is looking at is huge, as, as you know, it's, it's very difficult making computers that can understand I mean, computer vision is a very hard subject. Mm -hmm. So if you if you can use this powerful part of your brain in order to do mathematics, that's actually a big advantage. Mm -hmm. um, th 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 there are some areas where th this idea of converting mathematics into something you can explicitly look at is really powerful. Um, one famous example is, is Grothendieck. Mm -hmm. um, ma made commutative algebra a very visual subject by introducing this notion of the of the spectrum of a ring and working with it so i mean instead of having this abstract concept of a ring you you you, you can turn it into a more or less a picture that you can explicitly look at and you know allows you to see what the ring is doing instead of yeah. just trying to work with a lot of abstract equations right so uh, i mean i don't know if this is true but the human brain um if you go into higher dimensions then you just cannot visualize that anymore it's so complicated to the brain well you you, you cheat um you right. can sort of visualize things in higher dimensions and the way you do it is is you sort of suppress a lot of the dimensions mm -hmm. um so I, I i've actually done some work in high dimensions 25 or 26 dimensions to be precise yeah. and the, the the way you work in that is you think of them as being two or three dimensional objects mm. but you, you, you sort of somehow keep in mind um the the, the ways in which the, the two-dimensional object isn't quite capturing the 25 or 26 dimensional objects so you're 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 you, you can sort of to a, to a large extent you can work in you can think about objects in high dimensions by just thinking of objects in two or three dimensions and kind of working by analogy. Yeah, I think uh, that that is a really good way. Our, I've also heard there's computer, computers could do that for you as well to make it present it in front of your eyes. Like um, yeah, I, 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 I haven't seen many examples of computers helping with mathematics visualization. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a few examples. I've seen computer pictures of turning a sphere inside out and things like that and i must admit it doesn't really help me very much there's also called something called the ade theorem like from a to i classifying um different geometric um a shape groups into different numbers ade oh yeah yeah the ade correspondence yeah that, that that turns up a lot um in apparently completely unrelated areas mm -hmm. um for instance it it, it classifies um symmetry groups in three dimensions so, mm -hmm. so the the e in ade is short for e6 e7 e8 which turn out to correspond to tetrahedral octahedral and and icosahedral symmetries for example and then that the, they also turn up in all sorts of other things like classification of lie algebras or classification of singularities and so on um, right. It, it's, it's one of these mysterious things that that turns up in a dozen different mathematics areas and that, that, mm -hmm. that seem to have nothing to do with each other at first. Oh, yeah. In, in, fact, in fact, it even turned. In fact, <laughs> John, John Mackay even noticed the ADE correspondence turning up related to the monster simple group, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think has been fully explained yet. Oh, okay. So, it, so there might be further developments in that field and linkage between these two like ade and yeah, yeah well yeah the, the, the ade correspondence turns up all over the place and, and i'd be very surprised if it doesn't turn up in a few more unexpected places hmm. uh so throughout decades there are numerous uh, mathematicians um uh, are there any person um i know john conway is your advisor um 
Are there any other mathematicians that you personally really admire? Um, well, many of them. Um, I mean, the trouble with picking up one or two is is um, kind of unfair for the others, but it's unfair for the others. I mean, it's 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 like I, I remember there was some British regiment where they announced that they, they, they wouldn't be awarding medals because everybody in the regiment had done something particularly gallant and it would be unfair to pick up one or two people for the medals and they sort of feel like that about mathematicians they're, they're just very large numbers of mathematicians who've done something i think is spectacular yeah so I, i've heard that um because i i, I guess you um came from britain because you have a british accent i don't know yeah <laughs> Yeah. So, did you do your um, studies in in Britain? Yeah, yeah, in in Cambridge. Oh, uh, I, I've heard there's a professor called um, called Ben Green, and he worked with Terence Tao. Do you? Um... I never actually met him. I mean, yeah. Um, so I, I, I. Yeah, there's yeah. always different people out there, but um, yeah. Um, so is, is John Con Conway one of your most admired people in this math? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's probably had as as much effect on me as 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 anybody. Mm -hmm. So he actually inspired you into going through into math, or yeah. he, no, no, he didn't inspire me to go into mathematics. But uh, I think it's be largely because of him that I ended up working in the area of mathematics I was doing. Mm -hmm. And what were his ways of making you? go into that field like was, was he being really persuasive or no no he, he wasn't trying at all i mean i mean he yeah. i mean um i mean he, he wasn't really trying to recruit people into his field or anything um i mean i i think i mean the the reason was it, it was just john john Con john conway was where i first heard about the about the monstrous moonshine mm -hmm. um, yeah so it's the content that you're uh, yeah i mean if, if i hadn't been to that talk by john conway i might have ended up doing something completely different yeah yeah so i can tell he's a really great person but thank you so much for answering my questions it was a lot